So taxidermy is my thing. Unlike my predecessor, I know everything about taxidermy. I'm well up on the technical aspects of it, but I'm not going to talk about that today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a look inside my head. I'm going to um, uh, sort of give you some context and you're going to discover how I came to acquire a very large collection of Victorian and modern taxidermy. Um, my wife and I have a house here in St. Leonard's and it's pretty much a private museum. There's floor to ceiling, just taxidermy, and this is very, very, very much my thing. Okay, so just so you know, the bit of technical stuff I'm going to talk to you about today is just to describe what taxidermy actually is. And what it is, in a nutshell, is you have an animal, preferably dead, and then what you have to do with that is you have to skin it. You have to skin it so that you have the skin in one piece over here, and you have the inside of that skin in one piece over here. Right, so there's no blood and guts involved. If you see blood and guts, you're doing it wrong. That's not how taxidermy works. And then the next thing you have to do is take that form that you've just removed from the skin, and you have to recreate it in a different, with using a different medium, and there's lots of options you can use for that, including 3D printing. And then the idea is to put it back together again and make it look like it is alive. And that is usually the test uh, of, of good Victorian taxidermy at least, is if you were to see a photograph of it, would you think that this might be alive? So that's basically what it is, and uh, that's, that's um, you know, it in a nutshell. There are lots of people doing very different things around this one basic concept, but of all the, you know, of all the questions people could possibly ask me, the one thing people ask me a lot is, do you have a favorite? You've got all these animals, um, do you have a favorite? And the answer is, I actually do. And uh, these are my favorites. This, this is uh, Shep and Lulu. We've had Shep for six months, we've had Lulu for about a week, and they are the most divine creatures. And uh, we certainly believe that live animals are better than dead animals anytime. We don't eat animals, and we don't believe in shooting them to put them in boxes. And this is how we roll. So this is Shep and Lulu. And the good thing about having, I hope I'm not shouting, the good thing about having um, live animals as opposed to dead ones is that you can take them for a walk. And you can take them on the seafront at 8 o'clock in the morning instead of racing around the M25. And it is the most divine life. And I found myself doing that just this last week. And I had a spring in my step because I was feeling good. And I've had all this exercise, lost a bit of weight, bit of sun on my face, really feeling fantastic. And I'm walking these dogs along the seafront and I walk past some guys, and as I walk past, I heard someone say, hello, beautiful. So I thought, yeah, I'm feeling it too. And I looked around, and he was actually talking to Lulu. <laughs> yeah? So I thought, okay, well, that's, that's all very you know, interesting. But I should have had a bit of a heads up that time had passed, and this wasn't the 80s anymore, because just a little side shuffle here. Um, just before Christmas, I had a, a mammogram, right? And that was quite an interesting thing. Lots of women do that. And then uh, subsequently I had a mastectomy, and that was less fortunate, but everything's fine now, so that's good. But at no stage at all during any of that did anybody ask me if I might be pregnant, right? Not one of them. So I thought, okay, that ship has definitely sailed. Um, no one's going to be shouting hello beautiful to me in the street anymore. But these are the favorite animals that we've got, absolutely divine creatures. Um, it all started in a field, okay? The whole taxidermy thing started in a field. I used to go and take photographs of crop circles, and I was totally drawn to the fact that there were just researchers and fruitcakes in the same field on a sunny day. In crop circle land, everybody's a researcher, and I firmly identify with sort of the fruitcake mentality, so I quite enjoyed that. I don't believe that aliens have anything to do with it, but it was a fun thing to do. And as they got more complex, you can see those little dots on there are people, so, you know, it got more interesting, and so the weirdos turned up, and I couldn't stay away. And this woman's explaining why this crop circle is not a hoax because of something to do with the base of the stem. So anyway, that was what I used to do with my time. And then one day, I had a lunch break, and I went into a shop um, that just was near the garden centre with us having some lunch, and I bought a fish in a box, right? Not even a very remarkable fish in a box because it's got an eye popping out, and um, it's a 1950s piece, so it's sort of in that sort of awkward 
taxidermy sort of vintage period. It's not quite Victorian, not quite contemporary. It's just a very arbitrary thing, okay? But that's what started it off. That was the very first thing I bought. And then very soon afterwards, I tell you what, you just won't believe it. The, it got to the stage where the postman used to actually recognize me in, in different coffee shops around where I lived and come and bring the stuff to me there because so much stuff was coming through the door. I had this, this is an unfeasibly large box of squirrels dressed up having a tea party. I mean, it really is huge. Um, a cockfight, because why not have a cockfight in your living room? Um, a, a huge, um, rather beautiful actually, you know, box full of birds and plastic foliage or weird foliage, but hey, it's an Edwardian piece, it's very nice, I've got that too. Oops. Um, and why have one when you can have two? So you have a big one and a small one, and that's all good fun. Even teaching aids, not just the taxidermy, teaching aids. I have loads of, tax, of, of teaching aids, and I have all sorts of weird stuff. I have the hairballs that you find inside cow's tummies, all that kind of stuff. And a lion in the bedroom. So, you know, forget about the elephant in the living room. <laughs> we have a lion in the bedroom. And anyway, so this was now a few years ago, and I was living on my own, and uh, a friend of mine who came to, to stay with me for a bit, she was doing some study, she said to me, can I? She says, um, you know how you're single? I said, yeah. She says, you know how you like, quite like to get a date, but it's not quite happening? I said, yeah. She says, you don't think, you know, this kind of thing has got anything to do with it? She says, I'm not actually talking about the lion in the bedroom. I'm talking about the fight with Jesus and all the freaks, you see? So I said, well, no. I quite like it like that because if someone comes to my house or comes and sees where I live, you know, it's like a, a filter. You know, you either like it or you don't. And we can cut to the chase and cut the crap and, you know, get to the point. Okay, so I'm happy to say that shortly afterwards I did meet such a person. And um, um, my wife, Jordan, is sitting here and she loves all this kind of stuff. And I'm not going to show you what our bedroom looks like now, right? There we are. It's got all the freaks and the Jesus and an extra freak, a two-headed calf. So I'm very happy that this has uh, worked out. We're actually having our very first wedding anniversary on Sunday, so it's particularly a good week for us. But yeah, she liked it and I thought, yeah, I did rather well. We're lucky, lucky lady. So that's basically, you know, how, how my, what my house looks like. And this is our living room in our house in St. Leonard's, floor to ceiling with the Victorian taxidermy. Um, that's just a drop in the ocean. There's so much more and there's stuff in storage and there's stuff. It's just, it's a big lot of taxidermy. The ones that you see here are mostly Victorian and um, they, they're actually quite diabolical because up at the top we've got a kingfisher with a nest full of chicks all presumably killed for the sake of putting it in a box. I don't agree with that, but because they exist I thought, you know, I might as well have them be like a custodian of these interesting pieces. And so basically I've got all of these, these things here. Sometimes a label is all that it takes to make a bog standard piece quite interesting. So as part of that, that display, which you can't actually see, I have a, a badger, which is a bit bigger than usual, but nothing special, until you look at the label and see that it was shot on the Somme during the war. And you think, with all that stuff going on, you wouldn't have thought this would have been a priority. But um, that's the kind of thing. That's why, you know, it's interesting. So this is, this is our house. We do B&B for people who like this sort of thing. It's been uh, used for film shoots, or not film shoots, photo shoots, and uh, all kinds of things like that. So it's a fun space, provided this is your idea of fun. Okay, so I'm going to tell you very, very briefly, just show you a couple of pictures about how you actually stuff a bird. And uh, so you've got your, 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 your bird, and you do the skin thing where you remove the skin and what's inside is something that looks like that, uh, no blood and guts at all. You have to recreate that. We used wood wool, which is the sort of packing material you might get in apples because it's easy to you know, fix mistakes and things like that. And once you've recreated that thing exactly and getting the eyes right, that's really important, then you wash the skin and at this point, you, don't, you really don't think this is ever going to look like a bird again. But you just take a blowy thing, which might be a hairdryer or a hoover on backwards, something like that. And very quickly, it turns back into a bird. You put all the stuff, the, the, the mannequin back in, wire it up, and you now have a, a bird. So this is basically, in very broad terms, how it works. Okay, so Hastings has a really interesting history um, of taxidermy. 
There's um, this guy um, called George Bristow had a studio in Silchester Road, number 15 Silchester Road, and um, he had a, a reputation for acquiring birds that were rare or sort of almost unheard of in this area. And he had a lot of them and he actually made quite a lot of money. And after his death, he was discredited based on statistics because people said there's actually no way that all those birds you know, came to Hastings and they think he was taking advantage of refrigeration on ships and he was just basically fooling everybody. But unfortunately it happened after his death, he wasn't able to, to defend himself and there's actually quite a big um, campaign going on at the moment led by a guy called Pat Morris, who's a historian, uh, to try and clear his name because they think you know, there's certain factors that it might have meant that he did actually acquire all these things legitimately. But I knew about Hastings long before I ever thought of moving here because of this particular thing. So there are actually some people locally who are doing some incredible things. Jasmine Miles Long is, a, is, a, is an ethical taxidermist, also doesn't believe in killing things for the sake of taxidermy. She does a lot of museum work. Uh, she also does some interesting things with, um, with, with the groundwork where she um, uh, recreates some of the Victorian style groundwork using sort of ceramic and it's very, very interesting. Um, she, this is particularly good because this uh, cheetah was in formaldehyde for, I think, 37 years, um, and it had been donated um, from the Marwell Zoo to the Booth Museum, and no, people said there's no way that this can be stuffed after so long in formaldehyde. It just won't happen. And of course she did it, and it's now on display in the museum, and it was a successful project. So she's quite adventurous, very competent, very solid ethical taxidermist. Uh, this is a very rare bird, only 20 in the UK. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, you know, Hastings rarities and all that kind of thing. And uh, she had an opportunity to do that for a museum as well. So she's somebody locally who's doing interesting things in the taxidermy scene. Uh, another one is Roan, he's a really cool guy. Uh, he uses uh, found objects and various things to, um, to, 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 to study nature, relationship of nature with, with, with humanity over a period. And I particularly like this one because in the middle one uses pipe stems and uh, um, uh, uh, pipe bowls from a mudlocking uh, thing that someone was doing. So I did a lot of mudlocking in London on the Thames, so I particularly like the fact that he's used those there. Okay, so that's cool, he does these other things like that. And uh, my friend, and my favorite taxidermist is a guy called Robert Reed. He lives in Eastbourne. He is, this is a shoot we did and we're just having such fun. Him and his wife Rose are good friends of mine. Uh, he was a, a saxophone player his whole life. And about five years ago, he decided to get into taxidermy. And he is a proper artist. He knows exactly what he's doing. And um, he has, you know, he takes like small mammals, okay, vermin -y things that you wouldn't normally associate with being beautiful. And he does the most incredible things with them. And uh, this is a rat, and this is a water effect, and it all looks really, really interesting. He's particularly good with masks, fox masks. He really captures something beautiful in them every time. He's also doing interesting things with frogs and various amphibious type <coughs> creatures. The, the interesting thing about these is that they are very, very tiny, and you have to skin them through the mouth. And not everybody can do that, so pretty much every frog mount that you ever see will be a, a cast, but not his, his are all skin mounts. And his work is actually very reasonably priced, collectors buy it, actually some celebrities as well, and um, he's, he's actually a very good guy. There's some more frogs, teeny tiny frogs, and he's recently done all of this, these sort of series of uh, boxing hairs. So he's a very good guy, he's certainly someone to, to look out for if you ever need a taxidermist, these are the people to, to speak to. Um, and as if that wasn't uh, enough, I produced a magazine in my spare time called Taxi Mag, and uh, I, I explored um, the, the, the new culture in taxidermy where you had artists, mainly women, between I think 18 to 35, doing very interesting things uh, with, the, with the medium. And some people use um, neon lights, some people use dyes, and it's just a whole new way of looking at taxidermy. So I produced this magazine, it was such fun and people liked it, so I did some more. And uh, yes, that's one of the other things that I did to, to geek out on, on taxidermy. So I have some copies here if you want to have a look at them, thumb through them, they're really interesting. And they're quite nice to, 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 to hold and to look at. So please feel free to come and see. And if you now have any questions about any of this, now's a good time. <laughs> Excellent.
Thank you so much. in terms of pricing if you're buying taxidermy. It is a case of, you know, it could be anything. Um, you could pay a, a few hundred pounds for, for um, some of the Robert Reed stuff, which is a lot less than most people think, um, but you can pay um, many, many, many thousands for, for some of the, the very well-known uh, museum pieces. It's the Walter Potter Museum, very, very famous in taxidermy terms. It's the Holy Grail. You know, you can actually, there's pieces there that went for like 30,000. But um, I, I, my most expensive pieces are about three or four thousand. I have a Victorian kiwi, which is very, very sought after, and I have some other another, a flying cat, a winged cat, which came from a museum on the Isle of Wight, which also cost a fair bit. But I don't, I don't, you know, do that very much. You know, I like to spend a few hundred pounds on a on a case. Brilliant. That's right, man. Yeah. Okay. I'll run with yeah. my actually my phone. I'll just come to to, to university. <laughs> Can we come to your house? Yes. Yes, please do. I'm, I'm on Facebook. I live in Alfred Street. Hannah Ingleson, find me on Facebook. Definitely come and see me. That would be lovely. Yes. Yes. Anyone can come and see. Hi. I'm just wondering, you're saying that you don't kill the animals. No. Yeah. How do you come across them in the state that they can be stuck? Okay, that's also quite interesting. Right. So if we don't kill animals, we don't like to kill animals for taxidermy, how do we get them? Um, there are various ways. Roadkill is one of them, and you'll be surprised how often those are in actually very good condition. Also, you can generally fix things, but, but that's one of the ways. Um, a lot of zoos and people like that are, have relationships with taxidermists, and if, if animals die in captivity, or if bird breeders have a high mortality rate, they will usually um, have a deal with, with taxidermists and do it that way. Um, also, you see there's a bit of a, a, a grey area because there's a lot of, lot of animals and uh, sort of small rodents and things like that that are used in the pet food industry. People who feed snakes and other animals, you can buy rats and bunnies and all sorts of things um, in pet shops. And there are some taxidermists who will use that because it wasn't killed for taxidermy, although they were pretty much gassed for some other reason. So different people have their line in different places. But yeah, I just think that shooting something to make it look alive is just perverse. And so that's, that's our line. Having said that, all the Victorian stuff, the, the history there is diabolical. They were completely shot and killed and brought home um, as souvenirs or even by people who had never traveled to make it look as if they had traveled, you know. There were all sorts of reasons that people had taxidermy in their houses. And um, that's different. I collect them because they exist, but I would hate to see anything like that recreated. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Was there a question? Okay, I'll give you. I'll give you an example of, of something. A, a friend of mine who's a taxidermist rang me up from New York, and she says I just had a call from a vet in Devon saying that a two-headed calf has just been born on a farm in Devon. The, the farmer wants to sell the carcass to some people like us. She can't make it. Do you want it? So I got in my car in London. I drove all the way to Devon, pretty much in Cornwall, stayed over at, at Jordan's place on the way, and uh, bought the, the carcass, and then I drove it all the way to Eastbourne, took it to Robert Reed, and he skinned it and mounted it for me. Um, I then took the carcass all the way to York uh, for a guy to use a beetle colony to strip out the meat and to um, create a, 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 the skeleton. And, um, and, and that's how I came by that one. And actually the skeleton is often more valuable than the skin mount because you can see, particularly with a freak, uh, you can see it's real if you look at the, the skeleton, but you don't always know if the skin mount is for real if someone stitched something together. So, you know, there's always ways of doing it. I think, sorry, there was a question here. Well, actually, my question sort of relates to that because I was confusing. Really yeah. I believe. Um, in the Booth Museum there's a, a kind of like a mermaid creature that's clearly not real. 
Um, though that you refer to that as rogue tax, taxidermy, it's a fairly modern term, and people are doing artistic things with that by stitching different animals well, together. But that's an example. I thought that's what the calf was an example. No, yeah, because that's all yeah. wild stuff. No, no, they they are real. That calf in our bedroom was born in Bristol on yeah. a farm, still born, and they usually are. So that's how we got that one. But yes, a lot. Some of those those weird creatures like the yeti and the winged cat and some of those. At one point, we were actually made to deceive. You know, people hadn't travelled, so they didn't know. Oh, of course, the circuses and things. Yes, yes, side shows, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, I love all that. <laughs> <laughs> any other, any, any, yes? Yes. Why? Why? I don't know why. That's the only question I can't answer. I have no answer for why. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> Is it? So what is the feeling of seeing all these things or walking into my house? I think that depends very much on who you are. No, I'm asking you. Oh, me? Oh, I love it. I love it. I, I don't know. I see myself as a custodian. I'm a hoarder. I'm a collector. It's an illness. Okay? And uh, that's, that's the basic answer. But I, I just love it. I can't tell you why. But I, I can't get enough of it. And I love hanging out with people like Robert and Jasmine and Rowan and all these people. Because they're kind of living the life I'd like to lead. Sort of in a parallel universe. I'm a wannabe taxidermist. I did a course or two um, to try and understand technically what I was buying, but I, I'm not really a taxidermist. Although I have all the stuff and all the accessories, but no, I'm, I'm not doing that. No, 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 and B, you're so familiar with your pet, and you're so in love with the whole thing, that if it doesn't look exactly like your pet did, or it does in your head, then they think it's a failure. But it is? Yes. And it was very much the thing in Victorian times. In fact, on that slide of the taxidermy, there are a couple of domestic cats with, uh, that people did exactly that with. But no, we are not, I mean, I don't know, we are not <laughs> agreed this with you, <laughs> but I, I don't want to <laughs> any of my animals. Yeah. yeah, question. Oh, sorry. Question. I don't think you touched on this, but why did people start doing this in the first place? Okay. Was it, was it because they hadn't seen these animals or creatures? Right, I'll give you a brief answer. It, it started back in the day. Charles Darwin was a taxidermist. And on these voyages, you needed a taxidermist on board in order to bring specimens back before refrigeration. And the interesting thing about that is that a lot of these taxidermists were really bad. So they would actually, you know, bring back anatomically incorrect animals which nobody knew because they'd never seen them. So now in the historical record you've got ornithological and, and other sort of um, um, illustrations um, of, of birds and things like that which are just anatomically impossible because the only reference they would have had then would have been a piece of taxidermy that someone brought back. A very good example of this is um, in the Horniman Museum there's a walrus and the person that stuffed that walrus was sent the skin but had never seen one. So they thought they could just stuff it until it's you know, filled out and it's the size of a house. You know? But it stays there as a, as a reminder of that era. But there are things, I mean there's a lion that is quite famous in the subculture which doesn't even doesn't look anything like a lion because they received the skin and didn't know what the end result was supposed to look like. So that was one of the reasons it started out. Victorian times, I mean, it was all about souvenirs, all, the, all about collecting, acquiring, all that kind of stuff. Obviously, museums also used that a lot because they didn't have much else. We didn't have film or anything like that, or travel. So if you wanted to see something, often a stuffed specimen was, was how it was presented to you. All that's changing now. Museums are getting used to, rid of the, the collection. Schools are doing exactly the same, and they either end up in a skip or in my living room. I just wondered if you were familiar with von Goethe's work, who brought lots of these um, imagined animals to the, to the public and so he uh, uh, did lots of sculptures. No, what, what area is that? He did pieces to 
gather animals and um, presented them to to the public okay. as if they were real. So oh, that, okay. Maybe going back see. to that time when yeah. nobody had seen That's the easy. animals he was presenting. Okay, and I don't know that name. Got, was working, uh, I'm definitely, yes, yeah, that's what we did tonight. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant. There we go. Excellent. Can we thank Kana? Talk. I think you've converted at least half the audience to wannabe taxidermists. So, uh, marvellous. Oh, no. <laughs> A couple of resistors, but we'll work on that. The, um, fabulous. Thank you so much, Kenneth.